we're on a path and uh, believe you me this path that we're on is it's not a embraceable path meaning we've lost quite a few things humanity within itself do you guys know that if you watch the endeavors of man it's it's totally out of sync with everything God wrote totally out of sync here's what I mean by that we still have believers in Christ without direction now how can that be I'm not happy this evening either as far as uh, some things specifics but I'm going to address some controversial things you guys know I'm a controversial individual speaker I'm brainless pea brain whatever you want to call me but this was it uh, Friday a small story I told you guys Friday about a um, our being here why are we here you know, all throughout the Bible you hear words like don't love this world let's take that one for instance don't love this world and why in the world why would that be communicated to us don't love the world the carnal mind is enmity towards God what is carnal carnal mind right your earthly mindset your natural mindset physical mindset much like a uh, animal has instincts to do certain things naturally like hunt run all these different things we were made different than they were right we were out of necessity life changes which is why there is no evolution not the way Darwin proposed it there is no evolution because out of necessity animal life changes so does plant life to a degree right it does not become a brand new species each generation is improved upon it is based upon desires of the um, past generation now some may call that evolution I do not that's a natural process of accommodation All right, just like uh, our children are being born with the ability to use devices why because most of the parents have desire to create device in fact the way we look at life and how life goes forward is just totally a, a lie to a big degree and I'm not stepping on the toes of I'm not talking about research and medication things that is just not what I'm talking about there are unseen things long forgotten histories right that that people were proposed to you as though they are real but the fact is are they real and, and if they are real why do they contradict everything in the Bible why why well you have to look at mankind and you guys know that Mondays um, the schedule and I've outlined everything and if, uh, Mondays we discuss the principles of Christ but before you can ever discuss the principles of Christ we have to have some type of foundational truth of which we go forward correct not my truth not your truth the truth I mean, we've lived many years humanity has how far have we gotten have we truly made advances because the, the, the more we advance with things that we make the greater the degradation of society seems to be right are we an advanced species in our own right yes but if you want to know what we really are then you have to analyze what men fight for what you fight for so let's be blunt and candid shall we what we really fight for is our own paradise here on earth we fight for relaxation don't we we do we fight to relax think of the course of your days and the course of your years your highest complaint is not having comfort 
Thus, humanity as a whole has forgotten why they're here in the first place. Not they really have. How many of you know about your own life? Why do you face these trials and tribulations? That's something else. In the Word of God, we were promised to have trials, testings, and tribulations, weren't we? Yet we deny them because when they come, we don't want them. Most of us spend our time, the, the pure side of us does not want anything to do with this world. Yet we're in this world. We were sent here to this world. So what mindset is it to escape? I'll tell you what that is. That is because we don't and we have not inspected the long past foundations of man in the first place. Many people operate from a perspective that they want their life here to be a type of paradise. It's in fact, it's even preached from a lot of pulpits and ladies and gentlemen. That's simply not the way. It's not why we're here. It isn't. And it's, it's incredibly sad to see and a lot of people dispute that fact. They dispute it. So can we have some truth here? And I'm going to just talk a little bit before we get into some other subjects. And I do want your questions pertaining to this topic. As it does evolve. A long time ago, I made a statement that some people understood right off the bat. And it was this. The soul is forged through lots of pain. Not so much physical pain in the body, but learning in this earth, pains of this earth, situations that go totally wrong, right? Things in our lives that go, that are totally upside down, correct? And then we fight for the greater half of our lives trying to obtain a peace a type of peace that does not belong to us. Because your soul, you're not here. You are not here. I'm going to make a bold statement. None of us are here to have some type of comfort. To accept and, or to, let me say to, to have a type, some type of relaxation. That is not why we are here. It's not. It simply isn't. Jesus spoke against such things. God spoke against such things. In fact, when you go back to the Old Testament, you see some things maybe you didn't see before. It does not speak about a man having his paradise here because that's precisely what Satan pushes to have peace. Listen to me. This may get a little... Strange, but we're talking about the spirit of man and the spirits that are in this world. For instance, a lot of these spirits, no matter what you call them, these encounters people have had, this so-called higher knowledge from different places, resoundingly, they always seem to say, they always seem to say, well, we are to live together holding hands and doing this, that, and the other, and Everybody should have what they want and nobody should be in a type of trial or anything else. And we have to seek peace. And you know, in the Bible, it says through peace, he shall destroy many through peace. But we need to analyze what type of peace is being spoken of here. Why did the Lord say that we are to glory and or he laid by the Holy Spirit upon his apostles that we glory in tribulation, knowing what it works, knowing what it does, the end result of that. These questions and more, right? Many generations, many decisions. And then you think, why in the world does the Lord have to come back and destroy everything from off the face of the earth anyway? Why would the Lord come back and destroy the nations of the earth? Why would the Lord come back and do this? Why? 
We can't act like we know the answer. We must know the real answer. Not only should we know it, but live our lives accordingly. But we don't accept any more falsehoods. Because there are lots of falsehoods. What in the world is the beast system? How long has it really been in the making? If I can be so bold, can we go over these things this evening? Now, I'm going to do something here, guys, while everybody else is coming in. I'm going to go grab a piece of paper. There was something specifically that I printed out that I want to propose to. I want you guys a set of statements. I'm going to go over it with you guys. Just a set of statements. Because I'll say it again, and normally I do this, but how many people are free in their souls? Because if you're free in your soul, you have no complaints. How many people have no complaints about anything forever? How many? How many? If you have no complaints about anything, right? type a one. If you have complaints about something, and be truthful, type a zero. I mean no complaints about anything. I mean you're totally accepting of your past, of right now, and of what the Lord may bring. You to thank you, some zeros in there. That's what I'm looking for. Because the truth is, we do have complaints, but you know what we don't do? We don't address them by the word of God. Therefore, we keep those complaints. And we put on a smile, but it's not a smile. Isn't that a falsehood? That's not being free either. That's being bound with a face of freedom. Look out into the world at the dysfunction in these kingdoms. The inevitable is about to take place and nobody can stop it. The definition of peace, mildly defined. Politics purposely, purposely engaged thrust upon your lives, forcing you to think, behave, and respond under the control of something you know not what. You don't know what that controlling factor is. What drives a person to go run and spend some money just to satisfy themselves for a moment? We're going to go over these things. Because I can tell you this, if we don't prepare in truth, if we don't revisit the beginning in truth, great tribulation, we will see. Even greater than what we have now, the time of a great undoing, it stands at the door to humanity. And humanity is popped up against its own destruction because in fact at the end of days is it not the destruction of humanity that will take place it is a destroying of all ways of error blessings are utterly real but they're not what mankind thinks they are because God already named the blessings but man has interpreted blessings for him or herself so they can further their own paradise. Time to put that to bed. It doesn't work. How many of us are over the age of 40? How many? Over the age of 40. We know that the ways of men don't work. And it's not that everything is a bad idea. And it's not that some of them don't know what they're doing. But it doesn't work. There's no peace in the earth. Our life is not like the cartoons or what the visionaries saw to a degree. Even the striving of the eternal peace and rest in the Father has challenged our day-to-day -day lives. But why? Because I'll tell you this boldly. There is nothing God has ever promised that cannot be obtained, but you must not obtain it. Got to get your mind going. You don't obtain, go out and grab, take the blessings of God. 
blessings become part of your life or not. Most people don't think of it that way. To be blessed is to have life, that abundant life, not the abundancy of things and stuff. These false ways in the world have to be fought for. Isn't it strange that you never have to fight for truth? Because truth was in the beginning. Truth will be after everything is all gone. Truth is already established. So we need to revisit some things, don't we? Because something is amiss. It's not the word of God. It really isn't. The principles in the Word of God, no matter what language they are in, are still the truthful principles. But what happens is, we don't accept what God is doing, His manner of raising His own children. I'm going to demonstrate tonight that a further element of rebellion that we've been in, all of this is in the hope and the prayer that darkness be broken totally off of our lives that we may have bestowed upon our lives the freedom and the peace of Christ not the peace established by men through whom many are destroyed but the peace of Christ where life is found that one may discover life and have that life more abundantly through Christ. Because nothing can be done outside of Christ. That is truthful. Do you know that? Nothing can. The establishment of truth is what mankind has gone around. And that's why they need so many theories. Because they are attempting to obtain the unobtainable by their own way and not by the path of truth. I'm going to go grab these papers if you don't mind. I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, I'm back. have to have water. Much water. Where were we? We were discussing... Now, you guys did admit. You admit it about the complaints, the unspoken complaints, right? Like that you wish something was different in the earth, correct? Right? Because in truth, if all of us had a chance, if the Lord said, do you guys want to go home or stay here? You'd go home, wouldn't you? How many would stay here and not go home? How many? That could change after this evening that could change even that mindset that has been distilled upon us well we're getting into some tricky here's why I'm saying this listen folks we didn't just pop up here on this earth each and every individual was sent here by God by the Creator and if you were sent here, you weren't sent here to create a paradise for yourself. That's not why you're here. You were sent here for a very specific purpose. Now, all of us, when we were in school, there were times where we said, Oh, I can't wait till school is finished and over with so I can get out of here. Right? Those who enjoyed school it was too short for them but some understood what that education was for so you have three camps in school you have those who don't like school right you have those that like school and you have those that do not like nor dislike but they see the necessity of it those who see the necessity of school they're the ones that often make it, believe it or not, they often make it. They make it after school because they understand the necessity of that type of education. Those who like school too much, when it's over, 
There's nothing for them. Nothing for them. Those who don't like school at all do what they do to get out of school. And it is the longest. They have the longest classes. Right? School is something they dread going to every day and their life becomes meaningless. Why? Because they don't like it. Nor do they see the reasoning behind it. Only those who understand the reasoning behind education. Only those. They end up making it after. They reap the greatest of rewards. They really do. And it's not because they liked it or disliked it. They understood it. So whether they liked a subject or not, their motivation became truth. Here's the truth with education. If you're not educated, how can you, how can you do anything based upon that same education after school? Right? If you're, if you love school and you like the idea of school, a lot of those people love it so much that after school is over with, they feel empty. They're paradise for school. They feel empty afterward. They miss the school environment. And they like it for many reasons. Those who understand the necessity of school go on to do, they, they go to higher and higher levels in the world. Now that's just an example of something. Why? I can't talk about you. I can talk about me. Fact number one, I don't like this world. Fact number two, I'm not looking for an escape from this world either because I see the necessity of it, right? I understand that Earth is not for my pleasure. I wasn't sent here that everything be pleasurable. I understand that. All those who thought that Earth was somehow supposed to be their paradise did one of two things. They either woke up crying one day and said, surely it's not, because things have happened to them that prove them wrong. Consequently, the Lord has been speaking to all of us for a long time. Those who wanted this world to be a paradise for themselves, something happened to them. Killed it from the beginning, didn't it? And then we lived our lives saying, woe is me for all these things have come upon me. Those who love this world, who like the idea of this world, a lot of them have become upstanding criminals. And what I mean by that, they don't mind the idea that if three people fall in front of me, well, that's they did that, that's their fault, let me take their position. They don't mind that. The rich, they don't care that they can wear an outfit that can feed about 300 people in one day. They, they don't, it doesn't bother them. Their conscience is somewhat seared to a degree. Not that they're evil either. That's called ignorance. They don't know, neither have they considered certain things. Those who understand that this world forges the soul. They will go on to higher levels. Those who understand that they were sent here by the will of God, they wouldn't dare attempt to escape it. Because they would say, no, my creator sent me here. Right? Here's the mindset in this. If your creator sent you here, he sent you here for a purpose. And if he sent you here for a purpose, and to have a mindset that you don't want to do what the creator sent you here to do, well, that's not a good mindset, is it? But a lot of us do that out of not knowing. Because there have been time, times in my life I wanted to go. I'm going to be frank and honest with you. I didn't care what was in this world. I, I wanted to go. It was not for me. Till you remind it, the Lord has sent you in this world. And so we have to analyze some just some just common sense things. Common sense. Number one. All of us should know by now this earth, we're not sent here for pleasure. This is not paradise. Jesus said that he came that we may have life and have life more abundantly. 
Now, some of us took that to a whole new level. Because he said, listen to this, he said that he came that we may have life to have life more abundantly. Some people say, well, that's because Jesus wants you to have everything you want. No, he doesn't. Because he said, he also said, don't store up your treasure in earth. Didn't he? He also said, don't love the world. Didn't he? He said those things. So then when he came to say, I came to give you life, that you may have life and have life more abundantly. That means he brought us from death. Through him, we pass from death to life. What is life? When you accepted Christ as your personal savior, now I'm gonna just get you right here. Your eternity began. How many of you know that? See, because if you will not die and you're granted eternal life, then at the time of your acceptance, your life truly began didn't it? But something is amiss because our perspective of this world, we look at this world without the very cause of why we're here in the first place. And in so doing, you have these strange different spirits, mindsets, spirits. I'm going to put equals mindset. Can I do that? You have these different mindsets, mental states of mankind that keeps them in chaos, right? In other words, most of us get angry when something takes our peace. But the only peace that you could ever lose in this world is peace based in the world. The only thing you can lose in this world is what this world has given you. It isn't possible that you can lose something given by the Creator unto you. Some of us were real bad. And we still didn't lose our yearning for truth. Some of us are surrounded by what mankind calls truth. And we're still empty. Because we want the truth. So then it should let us know something is amiss. I'm trying to get that into you, right? The earth is not for our pleasure. It's not. In fact, I'm debating, really, praying and debating whether or not. But I will do it anyway because I'm controversial to open up Genesis in a way that you didn't see it before. Because most people get caught. I'm, I'm going to tell you what we do. We read the story of Genesis. It's a very simple story, right? It is. But then we read it, we understand it, we hear it, we understand that the surfaces of Genesis, but... We don't meditate upon it. We don't say, well, Lord, I tell you what now, if this, we don't take an interest in this way. We don't say, okay, so Eve was made of Adam. How did that happen, Lord? Now, I'm not saying ask that and then jump to the Internet. It's not what I'm saying. But if you want to know, why not ask the one who did it in the first place? Who gives to men wisdom? And understanding and it does so liberally if they ask for it but the only way to ask the Lord for something is by your soul's yearning for it you can speak it all day how many of you <clears throat> how many of you were excited 10 years ago I'm gonna show you how you changed 10 years ago you were enthusiastic you were excited you had a different type of energy I guess you could say about yourselves right you did and so then strange things you found yourself tightly in tune with the Lord saying, what is this? And your soul yearned for an answer. Let me ask you a question. What happened? What happened to all of us at the same time? What happened? Now we ask a question and 10 days later, we've forgotten that we asked the question in the first place. But 10 years ago, no, no, we didn't stop there. We didn't just ask. We sought for it. We didn't just seek for it. We wanted to understand it. We didn't just want to understand it. We wanted it from the Lord. You know what we did? We burned ourselves out through Google searches. That's what we did. That's what we did. We searched all over the internet 
which has become the world and we didn't find exactly what we were looking for now can I be blunt and then we go back to what the Bible it's in black and white sometimes in red and we don't want to labor to go through it we just want an instant answer because the internet gives us an instant answer why won't the Lord answer instantly somebody please tell me please tell me I'm wrong here because I'm not striking a chord with our very behaviors don't we get that way hmm don't we we get that way don't we we search the internet and we hear every listen here's what's bad because I've done this before myself there been there, there was a question one time I asked and I had to be careful doing this and so I go to different sources right I start looking all of a sudden I forgot what I was looking for because something else has captured my attention before you know it two hours have gone by nothingness I learned everything but what I wanted to know the entire premise of my questioning changed <clears throat> why because every time you search on the internet new knowledge is presented to you and when that happens you can deviate from your original question Hmm? And then we get frustrated. Because five days later we say, well, I, the Lord just won't answer. No, you demand it. Is what you did. And you went to go search the realm of men. You want someone to give you an instant answer. This is the world we live in. You don't believe me? Don't answer your text for three days. And let's see how many people are angry at you. Go ahead, do it, do it. Don't answer an email. Someone will say, well, what's wrong? If you don't answer in 30 minutes, an hour or days, somebody's going to say, well, what's wrong? This person must not like me. I didn't, if I, I didn't offend him, did I, or her? Huh? Some of you guys, you don't answer a text. You're living outside for a couple of days, right? Why? Because we live in a society of demand and who governs society who governs it does man govern society hmm I'll say this man does govern society but who governs the inspiration of man who does that it can only come from one of two sources and if they're not if they're if they're not of the Lord, then you know what they're of. Right? I said that to say this. We thought the earth was for pleasure. And when we came to Christ, that's precisely what we were looking for, sadly, didn't we? We wanted that reprieve. We said, yes, now I've accepted Christ. My life is going to be better. No, when we accepted Christ, Christ granted us life. Somebody's got to teach the truth out there. Because the day I accepted Christ in truth with witnesses, my life went straight down the tubes. Are you kidding? Everything began to happen backward. I fought every single day until I realized something. Because those, I'll call those days of frustration. You're excited. You're ready. Opposition comes and then you cry. Then you're excited and ready again, opposition comes, and then you cry. And when too much opposition comes, you begin to push all opposition away. Then you surround yourself with people who will not oppose you, and you name everybody else as your enemy. And then you find people who can't keep it straight within your circle, and you end up calling them serpents. And Lord forbid if somebody go against your own doctrine, you're going to begin to isolate yourself and say, well, nobody's any good. All right? Then you're all by yourself. Doing what? Yearning. <laughs> you're yearning to get out of the world among brethren and sisters who think just like you do. Not even knowing. Not even knowing. You were placed in a world of people in your shoes. Is that of God? Is that of our Lord? No, it's not. 
By the way, you can you live scripture all day for whatever purpose you want. I just hope it's in truth. Scripture out of context is not scripture. It is deception. Okay? Earth is not for our pleasure. It is not. So, a paradigm from Satan was planted in your heads. I'm, I'm gonna, listen, everybody who's had these weird spiritual contacts, they say the same thing all the time. You know what they say? We can have peace on this earth, don't they? Don't they say this? They plant this idea into the minds of men and women. The government speaks about it every single, every day they're talking about the same thing. Here's what they're talking about. Something is attacking our peace. Well, they're telling you where it originated from. They're telling you the truth. All these other entities. Well, humanity has to live together and have their paradise on earth. They say the same thing. What they've been trying to do for a long time is to create a paradise on earth. Why? Because that's not what earth is for. People read Genesis and they read about the garden being a type of paradise. And it was messed up. Right? And that's when man's teachings began. And people are trying to get that paradise back. So then all policy, in your eyes, has been trying to get a paradise back. Trying to make a paradise. Bottom line, what, with all the policies we have in the world, right? What are they trying to achieve, do you know? What is the end game to all the policies in the world? See, we have to think soberly about this. What is the end game? Hmm? What's the end game to all policies? Today's policies, every policy, people want affordable health care, right? They want health care. But it will never be affordable. Even when they give affordable health care, it's not affordable. For what, though? So that everybody can afford a doctor. Not afford Christ, but can afford a doctor. I can assure you, listen to me, saints. If you had zero dollars and your life was hinged to a doctor, then Christ wouldn't have had to come in the first place. If mankind had all that authority, right? You would need Christ for healing, would you? Um, would you? No, you wouldn't. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to make this world a world of peace where mankind governs all things. Why? Because that's what the principalities and powers want. To undo, you have to remember something. They oppose the word of God. Jesus will come back. The kingdoms of this world will be destroyed. And the residue will be dissipated and an everlasting kingdom is going to be set up that was not made by mankind nor principalities and power and spiritual wickedness rulers of darkness or anything else in high places it will be the everlasting kingdom all earthly kingdoms must go does that mean go ahead and destroy him right now no it does not that's a foolish thought to go ahead and get rid of everything right now is very extremely foolish because you're missing the initial premise. And the initial premise is this. Earth is not man's paradise. Earth is school. Earth is a place where the souls of men are being grown, tried through great trials and tribulations to teach mankind things. Because it is a fact that only in great affliction this man truly cry out the truth have you noticed that man does not cry out for truth when they're not afflicted they seek pleasure the kingdoms of this world are based on what pleasure entertainment when trouble comes it is often pushed away by mankind because they're not used to that how can you glory in tribulations as the word says right if you reject, if you reject the training, then the words say, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, right? 
How can that be? Have you ever looked at that? Tribulation works patience. That means tribulation takes a while. For each instance, no instant fix. And that patience gives you experience. What is the experience you can glean from patience? You see the truth of things through patience. Do you know that? You cannot see a real truth without patience. You can't. Through patience, through your waiting, lies fall apart. They do. Only the truth remains in the end. All of what you were frightened of, it didn't happen. That's called experience. Experience in what? In this world itself, because you're being taught the truth. You guys know that tonight I'm telling you how God teaches truth according to his word, not ours. Not man's words. Not people from other systems, as people say. Right? You can take any, and, the, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pain in people's neck, and I'll tell you why. Because all these other intelligences and inspiration from places people make up all the time, they circumvent patience. It's what they do. All this inspiration comes by way of salvation and edification of sal man's salvation, his own salvation, not through Christ. Tribulation works patience. Patience gives us experience. If you have experience in the problems of this world, it's no longer tribulation, is it? So let me put it to you this way. Suppose you have a very bad situation, health problem, cancer. It's not instantly healed. You go through all the treatments and it still is not healed. You're complaining, moaning, and groaning, and then after some years, you stop complaining, moaning, and groaning, and you'll say, well, the Lord's going to, the Lord will have his way. I'm here to do his work anyway. Well, after you do that, you find out. You find out a few things, like you find out life is truly not promised to man for the next day. You find out things you have taken for granted when you were in your health Oh, you find out a host of things, don't you? Because while you're waiting to be healed, you're not healed. While you're waiting for relief, you're in pain, discomfort. That reminds you of how many things you've taken for granted. It reminds you of the grace and the great grace and mercy upon your life. Because there were days you didn't have any pains, you didn't have any aches. You're reminded of those things you complained about and you shouldn't have. Because now you have a reason to somewhat complain because it hurts, it's uncomfortable. And even with that, your experience in the matter is showing you that you're not going anywhere until the Lord says so. That life is not based upon anybody's chart. But your life span is based upon God's will when you belong to Him. That experience gives you hope. Hope comes to you because you realize, okay, the Lord was not lying. I just looked at His word like a child. You gain more and more hope because you say, wait a minute. I'm truly not dead and I'm able to serve Him. Though I'm still uncomfortable and in pain, all of a sudden this it doesn't really matter like it did in the beginning. Then you realize, oh, I was just scared of death. But since death has been knocking at my door over and over again, and it can't come in, something else has the reins of my life. When your hope increases because you realize the Word of God is real, right? Guess what happens? You'll say, guess what? Yes, they said I had cancer. I may be sick. God's will be done anyway. And when that takes, when that takes its toll upon your life, when you start saying God's will be done anyway, regardless if I'm sick or not, God's will be done, oh, now you're on your way. See, now you're on your way. 
Because at first, you were saying God's will be done if I'm in health and if I'm okay. But because you were not in health and you were not okay, you complained about it just a little, but you didn't die. And because you didn't die, you said, wait a minute, what is all this for? And there were many nights of anguish, many days of turmoil in your mind. Because that earthly spirit, your belief in what was not real, you had to face. You see, because most believers don't really, those believers who don't have cancer, I'm not going to get cancer. Because I speak healing over my body, and then they get cancer. Right? And when something like that happens, you begin to say, wait a minute, Lord, so it's one of two things. Either somebody lied to me, I lied to me, or you didn't tell the truth to me, which is... So God's way and his precepts and his words continue while man's words fall apart right in front of your face, which builds a hope within you that, yes, my Lord is real, my Lord is true. At the end of the matter, when you're still going, and you may still have that condition, you begin to say, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I have. It matters how I serve my Lord. It doesn't matter what's gone, who's gone, who stays. It matters that my servitude is real and not based upon some deal. Most people say, Lord, I'll serve you if you do so and so. People who have had cancer for a while, they no longer say that. They get to the point, they'll say, Lord, I'll serve you anyway, regardless. Rich or poor, free or bond, I'm going to serve you. In pain or healthy, I'm going to serve you. And then they begin to ask for two things. Like, Lord, help me to understand the truth that my servitude may be in truth. Lord, don't hinge my motivations upon my health or help me not to ever do that again because it was a lie see you be, you begin to believe you begin to believe in him even more because you begin to realize I was believing my Lord based upon false premises I was okay with the Lord so long as my life was okay but when it fell apart so did my faith Lord I do not want my faith hinged to anything physically that may or may not happen to me See, then those folks who the world points at and say, they're not blessed, they're cursed. Look, they have cancer. Their faith is being qualified. Their walk is being qualified. The truth of the word of God is being qualified. They're not falling for tricks. Those are the same people once they get it. You can't make them sad again. You can't. People get sad because something didn't turn out the way they wanted. They're disappointed. That's why they're sad. But when you know the truth, the truth can never disappoint you because truth is truth. And it's not based in a lie. When we get sad and upset, it's because something did not turn out the way we thought it would turn out. That's part of our process. In that person's sufferings, the soul is being forged. Now, a soul is forged based upon truth, which means all falsehoods must be exposed and done away with. That person is being purged. Hmm? I know this from my own life. There are certain times if I were healed one day too early, I would have gone back into the same state I was prior to the problem. I thank God every day for everything I went through, whether I did it or not. Because what it did was it caused, see, you can't steal my joy anymore. Health can't steal my joy. Success or failure cannot steal my joy. It's not based in those things. It's not. Because it's hard to fake when you're truly broken in the heart to not be broken, isn't it? You know how many broken people are walking around, they're rich, they seem to have everything they want. They're broken inside. They're not themselves. They're not. But when you begin to have wisdom and understanding from above, and that comes through great pains and great losses, well then, pain and loss can't even move you anymore. You see, that's what the truth does. The truth makes you free. I'm sure I read that somewhere. Oh yeah, it's in the Bible. 
You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Why? Because anything in this earth of you that can be broken to smithereens is in fact of this earth. It is not of God's kingdom. And we being children of the Creator, being sent here that our souls be forged and grown and become a witness to the truth, we must ourselves become truth. You cannot become truth so long as you live a lie or believe in a lie. So naturally all those things must be broken in this world that you may become truth. Right? We love to call ourselves children of God. I'm a brother of Christ. Right? It's, we're, I'm a joint heir with Christ. But there are qualifications that come with that. You see, I thank God for His grace and mercy. I'm not destroyed through His process in my life. With the sins I have committed, I should have been killed. But it wasn't that way. Instead, I faced a penalty. An earthly penalty. Is your physical... Is, you reap what you sow, but you're also broken of falsehoods. Hmm? All the falsehoods break away. And when the falsehoods break away, they can't get to you like they once did. You remember, you guys, I told you, I've been stabbed in the back a lot. And when somebody doesn't guess what I say, oh, it's okay. When they come to their senses, I'll say, it's okay. It's all right. Your flesh, I'm flesh, all of us have the potential to stab somebody in the back. Let's go forward. I know you did that. Right? I forgive you, you forgive yourself. Learn of it, and let's go forward together. I don't hold grudges. For what reason would I hold a grudge? That makes no sense to hold a grudge. There's no bitterness in me against anybody. Why? Because in truth, we're all the same. Whatever act you commit against me, I've surely done to somebody else. It didn't matter at what level, right? Let me give you an example. If you slice a small piece of steak that wasn't yours, and somebody else comes and slices a big piece of steak that wasn't his, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Both of you stole something. So what's the difference? There is no difference. There's no difference whatsoever. No difference. <clears throat> and because there's no difference, right? Because sin is sin. How can you do something I'm not guilty of? If you sinned, how can I be mad at you because you sinned against me when I surely sinned against somebody else? And when somebody lives in the flesh, you know what their capabilities are because you know your own. You know the time you hung up the phone and said some colorful words and nobody heard you but you and the Father. And every other demon out there, they knew how to get you going. What's the difference in doing that out loud if I hear somebody curse me out out loud? Or me even thinking a negative thought against somebody else? What's the difference? There's no difference. Both of it is to have ill will against somebody else, isn't it? Doesn't matter how you have that ill will. You had ill will. Of course, a lot of Christians, well, I just, the Lord's going to show him. Yeah, but he's showing you first. Because you're the one in this situation. In that revenge, when we say that, the Lord's going to show you. That's revenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So what I'm telling you is this. The soul is forged through a lot of tribulation, pains, losses, you name it. But it's training and instruction you can't get anywhere else. The story of the ten virgins. Often people talk about the oil and they have interesting views, right? All of us have some interesting views on that, right? I'm beginning to see the oil as one thing and one thing only. I know a lot of people say it's the Holy Spirit because oil is used. Well, I looked at the context of which Christ did speak. They all fell asleep. They were all, all awakened. They all trimmed their wicks. They had the lamp, they had the wicks, but some had no oil. But oil, they couldn't share it. They couldn't share it. 
How can you not share it? See, even with the, the you can share the truth. You can share the word of God. You can share an anointing. But there's one thing you can't share. And you know what that is? Experience. You can't share your experience. You can't do it. Experience must be purchased. You can't do it. You can't share it with anybody. So you, if somebody wants your experience, which keeps your lamp lit, no, they have to go pay their own price for that. To those who sell it. Who sells that experience? That's your life. That's why they didn't make it back. All those things you've gone through is just more oil in your lamp. It's not some kind of curse upon your life. <laughs> because you love the Lord. It's oil. That's what that is. You can't share that with somebody. You can tell somebody about your experiences, but until they pay the price for their souls to be forged, their lamp will not stay lit. Somebody who can just drop the faith just like that has no experience. And there we are again. Tribulation works patience, patience, experience experience hope you see you have to pay a price for your experience because it comes by way of patience great pains great tribulation works patience the result is experience hmm? You thought your life was for nothing. No, you're being taught, you're being trained, you're being instructed. And this is what mankind has lost. See, they thought life was a paradise and that's why we complain so much. We complain about what we don't have or somebody did something to us not even knowing that we were sent here. The conditions of our lives have been, you know what, hey, can I just say this? If you, if your life choice comes into play right now the Lord says you're bought with a price you're bought with a price you are you're bought with a price if you're bought with a price then you're predestined can you understand that before you were bought with a price before you accepted that of Christ you were plagued with choices and somehow you couldn't make the right ones could you Think about it before you were truly saved. I'm not talking about the time you opened up your mouth to everybody and said, I accept the Lord as my personal Savior. And two days later, you went out drinking. I'm not. I'm talking about that special moment you had all by yourself when you thought about the Lord. And you said, oh, no, Lord, I truly choose you. That time when you did that, nobody was around. That was your own special moment, right? When you did that, when you truly did accept the Lord internally, you truly did confess all things of yourself by way of the soul itself. When you poured your heart out straight to the Lord, when tears overtook you, when you felt unworthy like a piece of garbage because you realized what you really were, and when you were so thankful he died on the cross, and you asked him, Lord, forgive me for so foolishly accepting you by way of words when I walked away from you right after I did it, when you really accepted Christ, you were bought with a price. Do you know that? That's when that price was in effect. And when that happened, then you were predestinated. When you're predestined, do you have choices? Huh? Let me give you some understanding on this. Before you had choices, you could choose good or evil. But when you accepted Christ, and you gave your life to Him, He's guiding you. Do you know that? See, when you submit to him, really, when you really submit to him, you're predestined. You're called. You're the chosen. And when that happens, you stop making choices because you've already chose. And when that takes place, you are predestined. Do you know that? When you're predestinated, it's not about choice not about a bunch of little choices. It's about the choice. Do you know that? Because a, to be predestinated means you have, you're no longer making a choice on where you go. 
That's why Jesus said, follow me. And if you said, yes, I'll follow you, you made a choice. While you're making that choice to follow him, you're also doing something. What's that called? Obedience. You're obedient to him. So long as you follow him. Not following me, not following anybody else, but following Christ. And when you do that, because you're obedient, you're a child of the living God. And he takes you from level to level to level. He's raising you up. Prior to that moment, you had a choice, many choices, Then You were plagued with choices. Hmm? But he called you and you responded to the call. That was the choice. When that happens, it's no longer you that lead your life, but he leads your life because you're following him. And because you lead, because you're no longer leading your own life and you're following Christ, and you're led in the way of the kingdom of God. You still learn. You still see. You still experience. But you also walk in a shadow of authority, a shadow of all truth, a shadow of unyielding love. And you don't want the world anymore. And you begin to understand what the world is really here for. You begin to understand that, yes, I'm sent here. And because you're sent here, you have something to do. And because you have something to do, you no, you no longer wish to return to the Father with an undone work. So then your heart gets poured out into your work. Which is, in fact, his work, not your work, his work. You want to be led of the Spirit. By doing so, you become qualified to carry the authority of the Most High via the Holy Spirit in this earth. And when that happens, you're not leading your own life again. You're an ambassador for the kingdom. An ambassador does not walk in his or her own way, but in the way of the kingdom, an established kingdom. A true ambassador represents the kingdom where they come from. An ambassador to Christ does not represent him or herself, but the glory, the authority, and the words of the living God. There is no Satan, no devil, or anybody else who can overcome that. They can only oppose that. Whom he called, he also qualified, it says. Most of you have had disastrous lives, so you think. That was part of your qualifications. See, I'm kind of bold now. You, without the drugs, you can never talk to someone addicted by drugs. By the way, it's a plague in this world. Without being among where, whatever your discipline is, whatever you did wrong in your life, if you were around billionaires and millionaires, so be it. Now you know how to speak to them too. You also have compassion upon those you're sent to. Isn't that wonderful? You have to have understanding about those you're sent to. Paul was raised that he may be sent to the Gentiles who lived the same way he did. Paul was somewhat ruthless. He had to be sent to those who were ruthless. Peter couldn't do it. How could Peter do it? Peter couldn't do that. Peter was, Peter was sent. Where was Peter sent? Do you guys remember? What about John? Where was he sent? Where, hmm? There are people in your background, your family members and everybody else. You've been qualified to understand exactly why they do what they do because you lived in one of their lives. Isn't that wonderful? It's not awful. It's wonderful. We think so backward sometimes. If you were raised and you were just a lying thief and a scoundrel, you've been qualified to go back to the lying, thieving scoundrels. That you may have compassion and understanding upon them because you have to know their war. Someone who's not been of a background of a prostitute, how can they ever connect to a prostitute? You see that with the disciples, you really do. Whom he called, he also qualified. You're qualified for the, your calling. But what has happened is this. Many people have called themselves. Because they're so embarrassed about their own past. 
Right? Now follow me. Because they're so embarrassed about the deeds they have done in their lives, they totally disconnect from it and go to a whole other group of which they cannot relate to. Hmm? Some of you have that with your family members. You say, well, they don't want to hear a word I have to say. No, they're supposed to live the, see the life you live. They can hear your life you live. They don't hear what you have to say. They hear how you live. They're sitting there watching you. Everything you do, how, how is it that they know everything you do? Because they're sitting there watching. With your family, you live a ministry toward them. They will provoke you to the ends of the earth. And your response must be of the kingdom. That's how they learn. That is correction for them. They will see it's possible. But if you attempt to talk and smash mashed potato, or the gospel, right, down their mouth like mashed potatoes, you're going to provoke them. Because they think they already know you. Right? They think they already know what you're going to say before you say it. You can pour out your heart and they'll say, oh, you're just too biblical. But they can never deny how you live. And it doesn't matter what they've heard, it matters what they see. They can hear all sorts of bad things about you. But because your family, when they see how you respond, that makes a difference for them. But the things you've been in, you have been a part of the people you are sent to connect with. See, with the Word of God, you must have love. How can one love a prostitute if they don't know what prostitutes go through? How can you love an addicted person when you've never been addicted to anything? You say, well, I don't see what's so hard about just stopping and saying no. You can't even relate to a person who's been addicted. You have to be able to reach them. You've been qualified to reach them. Some people out there are struggling right now. You're saying, well, I'm trying to stop. I'm trying, I'm trying. Well, don't worry. Because one day you're going to say, Lord, I need to represent you and I can't do that this way. And then your motive for stopping will be real and true. Stop Some people try to another person and then when that other person is gone, they pick up the habit again. Because their motivation was within the earth, not necessarily of a truth. Some people represent the Lord. Still, they're still addicted to things. And then they realize, I, I can't do this, unless I cause one of these little ones to slip. Lord, you've got to help me in this. And then you get stern. And you start saying things like, I will break this. I knew I slipped up yesterday. I will break this because you're doing it not for yourself. You're doing it not for the reasons most men would think you would do it. You're not trying to live longer. You're going to do it so that you can properly represent the Lord in this earth. Now you're doing it for an unending cause. Hmm? That's when it will be broken.